Coming up on today's show, Faraday Future calls it a day, for now. Tesla readies itself for the Model 3 launch. And just how fast will the Lucid Air go when its speed limiter is removed? These stories and more coming next on 10. Like all our content, today's show is funded by the in-stream ads on today's video and by the kind donations of viewers like you. Follow the link at the end of today's video to make a monthly donation to our Patreon crowdfunding campaign to help keep us independent and impartial. And if you're already donating, thanks for your continued support. It's Friday, July 14th, 2017. I'm Nikki Gordon-Bloomfield, and I'm very grateful to those of you who've helped push Transport Evolved over its 23,000th subscriber this week. I'm seriously blown away and never thought that this tiny little channel would grow to the size it has. So thank you. At the end of last week's show, I told you that Faraday Futures FF91 had set a new record at the iconic Pikes Peak Hill Climb Circuit in Colorado in the production electric car class. And at the time, I mused that seemed a little unfair because the car wasn't technically in production yet. Well, this week, Faraday Future shelved its plans for the $1 billion Nevada factory where the FF91 was due to be built, saying it was working on restructuring its plans for a more modest production facility. It also happens to have taken place one week after a Shanghai court froze the assets of Faraday Futures' Chinese owner after he failed to make on-time loan payments to various Chinese banks for his other big company, Le Echo. Faraday Future and the FF91 isn't dead yet, of course, but it now seems inevitable that we'll be attending a funeral sooner rather than later. On to happier news now, courtesy of my home adopted state of Oregon, where Governor Kate Brown has finally signed into law a new electric car initiative for the Beaver State that will give residents an additional $2,500 off the price of a new plug-in car. Oregon, already known for its excellent electric car charging infrastructure, didn't have a plug-in car incentive scheme, but it's hoped that the new incentive, paid for by various other measures, including a rise in taxes, will get more of the state plugging in. And to help compensate for some of the lost gas tax revenue from all of those people switching to electric cars, the state will levy a small surcharge on EV registrations from 2020 onwards, something that's far more popular than the pay-per-mile taxation system the state was toying with for a while. So well done all round. Meanwhile, in Europe, Nissan said this week that it expects one-fifth of all new cars it sells by 2020 will be electric, citing an increased interest among European buyers in EVs, as well as legislative and regulatory changes designed to reduce the number of internal combustion engine vehicles on the roads, or in some cases, banning new sales of them altogether. At the same time, another independent study, this time by Dutch bank ING, predicts that all new cars sold in Europe will be electric by 2035, something which not only backs up Nissan's predictions, but shows us what kind of growth curve electric vehicle adoption is expected to go through in the next 18 years or so. I hope they're both proven right. Of course, electric vehicle incentives can help increase electric vehicle adoption rates as they make plug-in cars more financially lucrative to buyers. But as I've already pointed out earlier on in this show, it's not always just tax breaks that make people dump the pump for a plug. Or is it? Because as we learned this week from the Washington Post, Tesla failed to sell a single electric car in Hong Kong during the month of April, immediately following a change in policy which saw the Model S and Model X lose their eligibility for incentive, consequentially raising the effective price by more than 175,000 Hong Kong dollars, equivalent to about 45,500 US dollars. With the price of Tesla's already high in China, due to shipping costs and import taxes, it's hardly surprising the massive change in price caused people to go cold on Tesla, and it illustrates how badly Tesla needs a Chinese factory. Will the same thing happen in the US when Tesla reaches its 200,000th car and loses its incentives? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Sticking with Tesla a little while longer, it's been working hard this week on getting its sales and service network ready for the Model 3's launch later this month, which I'm sure, as you'll remember, entered into production last week. So far, Tesla has been opening up a series of new service and sales locations, as well as beefing up its mobile fleet of service rangers with more staff and more equipment. The goal? 
to make sure that most service issues can be resolved without a customer ever visiting a service center. And at the same time, Tesla has published plans for some major expansion to its supercharger network, including plans for new supercharger sites with 40 or more supercharger stalls. Given the number of cars it wants to make in the next few years, I think this is a smart move. All those queues at the most popular Tesla supercharger sites are just going to get longer and longer. Don't you agree? It might now be nearly three years since the Volkswagen Dieselgate scandal broke, but we're still seeing more and more companies implicated in emissions scandals, ranging from incorrect laboratory testing practices through to purposely fitting hardware designed to circumvent regulatory tests. So far, we've seen Renault, BMW and Fiat Chrysler implicated to some degree, and now it's the Toyota Daimler, which, as Reuters reported this week, is now under investigation for selling more than one million cars in Europe and the US with excessive emissions. At the moment, the company is suspected of making false claims and advertisements and potentially fitting cheap devices in diesel-engined cars, but until the investigation really kicks into gear, I'm guessing we won't know for sure. What's sad, of course, is that all of these automakers could have easily avoided the problems by focusing their attentions elsewhere, like electric drivetrains, for example. Oh well. Earlier this year at the Geneva Motor Show, Renault unveiled the Zoe eSport concept car, a hot hatch inspired vehicle packing the standard 40 kilowatt hour Renault Zoe battery pack, but putting out 320 kilowatts of power at the wheels thanks to a dual motor setup. At the time, I had some serious car love, as did some of you, but we never really expected it to enter production. But as Autocar was told by Renault this week, a production version of this concept, called the Zoe RS, could enter production by 2020, making it at least conceivable that the day of the electric hot hatch could soon be upon us. And I, for one, can't wait. It's not confirmed as definite yet, but the way Renault talks about it, it's certainly being seriously looked into. Watch this space. Hyperloop One, one of the two commercial entities trying to turn Elon Musk's Hyperloop Alpha white paper into a commercial reality, hit another milestone this week by completing its first full-scale Hyperloop track test at its facility just outside Las Vegas, Nevada. Sadly, the test wasn't anything to get super excited about. It was a 70 miles per hour slow speed track test involving a full-sized dolly traveling in a vacuum. But from here, the company says it will be working up to test speeds of several hundred miles per hour before moving on to reach the ultimate goal of 700 miles per hour or more. It's also just completed building its first Hyperloop capsule test prototype, which looks a little bit like a high-speed train. I guess that's what it is, but I can't wait to see it in action. Tesla's referral program is now an established part of Tesla's marketing strategy, leveraging existing happy owners to help encourage more people to the brand by offering discounts off new cars to anyone who uses the referral code of an existing owner when they place their order. And part of the process, of course, is rewarding those owners for making the referral in the first place, offering a tiered incentive program that gives kickbacks and perks for each referral they make. Well, this week, we learned that Tesla has unlocked a new high-end referral treat for those high-rolling Tesla owners who make a lot of referrals, the chance to get a heavily discounted next-gen Tesla Roadster or for those who refer enough people, a free next-gen Roadster. Now, I did make a video on this during the week, but I'll admit to getting the math a little wrong. But if you want to find out more, be sure to watch it when this show is over. With a large number of automakers now serious about building electric vehicles in decent volumes, we heard this week that Volkswagen thinks that the automotive industry will need about 40 gigafactory-sized facilities in order to switch one quarter of their fleets to electric by 2025. That's a little high, considering Tesla CEO Elon Musk recently claimed 100 gigafactories could turn the world off fossil fuels for transportation and energy for good. But we're certainly on the brink of a major boom in battery manufacturing regardless. Which is possibly why Daimler announced this week that it intends to build its own battery production facilities inside one of its existing facilities. And electronics giant Siemens announced a new partnership with AES to form Fluence Energy, a new company dedicated to designing and manufacturing massive battery storage systems to help us dump oil, gas and coal forever. My take on this? The lithium-ion production facility marks a new industrial age for us all, and here's hoping it's cleaner and greener too.
Spend any time in any major metropolis and you're guaranteed to witness the idiocy that takes place when an emergency vehicle needs to get by and car drivers either ignore the vehicle altogether or do the stupidest things to try and get out of the way. And with the world of autonomous vehicles just around the corner, it may be something that's mercifully about to die out as more and more people rely on their cars to do the driving for them. But to make sure its cars behave more appropriately when an emergency vehicle is around, Alphabet's Waymo has just spent time with its local emergency services, training its cars on how to detect and respond to emergency vehicles. It's quite the interesting situation too, as autonomous vehicles may find themselves breaking the usual rules of the road, such as crossing a red light, just so that emergency vehicles can get past. I guess we'll have to wait to find out just how the AI handles it and how those coding the system get around all those rule-breaking situations. As some of you will know, by the end of this year, Tesla will have hopefully completed installation of the largest ever grid-tied energy storage system in the world in Southern Australia, a project Tesla CEO Elon Musk said would be free if the company couldn't supply and install all of the equipment necessary to make it work within 100 days of signing all the necessary contracts. Well, Tesla hasn't said how many power packs it will need to install in Australia to complete the project, which will tie the power packs to a total of 99 massive wind turbines, the total power output of the system is expected to top 100 megawatts, which is enough power to provide 30,000 homes with power instantaneously. And with Tesla already working hard to produce the battery cells that the system will need, PopSci has done a really nice article explaining how the entire system will work and how it will all be tied together. If you're into engineering, you should check it out after this show. And finally, by now you should be aware of Lucid, another Silicon Valley electric car startup eager to take some of Tesla's market share away from it. Far more organized and a lot less flashy than Faraday Future, Lucid has always focused on the drivetrain first, with one of its early prototypes, literally a high-powered electric white van, spanking a whole range of vehicles on the drag strip. And as you may remember from earlier this year, Lucid's pre-production air electric sedan peaked at 270 miles per hour on the test track during beta prototype testing. But last week, the Lucid Air went back to the test track with its speed limiter removed to see how fast it could go, hitting an eye-watering 235 miles per hour. That's 378 kph. Naturally, driving at that kind of speed on the road is illegal in most places and you drain your battery pack pretty quickly at that speed. But hey, it's good to see a plug-in car give the fastest cars in the world a run for their money now, isn't it? And on that note, it's time for me to say goodbye for the week. As always, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and hit that notification button to make sure you don't miss an episode. And if you like what I'm doing, why not contribute to this show's costs via Patreon? I've left a link at the end of this video and in the description below. As always, I'll be back next week with more cleaner, greener, safer and smarter transportation news. But until then, thanks for joining me. I'm Nikki Gordon-Bloomfield. That was 10. Have a great weekend. And until next time, keep evolving. Yeah.